Chapter 2. The Various Greek Texts The various editions of the Greek text, that of Stevens of 1850, and Eliezer, or Texas Receptus, Graysback text, Blackman led in a new direction, followed by Tissendorf and Tregellus. Tissendorf and the Mount Sinai manuscript, the principle of ancient evidence only, Alford's text. We have spoken briefly of the difficulties that must be met by those who undertake to compile from the scattered and diverse original sources a Greek text of the New Testament. That great task has nevertheless been undertaken by able scholars at different times and, as the outcome of their labours, there are in existence at the present time several complete texts. We will now give a brief account of the most important of them. Stevens, AD 1550. The text of Stevens is that which served as the basis of the authorised version in its production and the compiler was guided in large measure, though not exclusively, by the comparatively recent manuscripts 9th, 10th and 11th centuries, which had been in use in various churches of Europe, Asia and Africa. It might be supposed that Stevens was at a disadvantage with respect to later compilers in that he did not have the benefit of the manuscripts, particularly the Vatican and Sinaitic, which were available to later editors as Tissendorf, Tregellis and Westcott and Hawke. But the fact is, and this we hope to make quite plain, that the comparative excellence of the text of Stevens and the Eliezer or Texas Receptus, see next subheading below, is due to no small degree to the fact that in its composition the Vatican and Sinaitic manuscripts were not consulted. The comparatively late manuscripts from which the Stevens and Eliezer texts were mainly compiled were of course copies of older ones which were in time used up and which themselves were copies of others still more ancient. In all this copying and recopying there would inevitably have crept in the various errors to which copyists are liable. Moreover, in some cases there are alterations purposely made from one motive or another. When an error crept into a copy or was purposely introduced it would naturally be perpetuated in copies made from that one and thus variations from the original would tend to multiplication. There was, however, a check upon this tendency for such was the reverence paid to the sacred text and such the desire that copies used in the churches should be pure that every opportunity would be embraced for comparing one text with another and where differences were observed there would be naturally an investigation for the purpose of establishing the true reading. Thus by examination and comparison of a moderate number, say 10 or 20, comparatively late manuscripts from widely separated points it would be possible to establish almost to a certainty the original reading of any disputed passage or if it were a passage whose authenticity as a whole was questioned to decide whether it was a genuine scripture or not. Elziva or Texas Receptus 1624 This edition with which the name of the fame of the great Erasmus was associated has been for centuries and still is the best known and most widely used of all the Greek texts. While this justly famous edition is later by some years than the publication of the authorised version. The difference between it and its immediate predecessor, the Stevens edition, are so few and unimportant that the two may be regarded for all practical purposes as one and the same. Thus, all the scholarship back to the Texas Receptus is an endorsement of the text which served 
as the basis for the translation of our authorised version. It is apparent from what has been said already that if the revisers of the 19th century had used the same Greek text either as it stood or with such corrections as might seem justified by the discoveries made subsequently to 1624, they would have given us a version having a comparatively small number of changed readings. In fact, it is within bounds to say that if the revisers had given us simply a corrected translation of the Texas Receptus instead of a translation of an entirely new Greek text, we should not have more than a small fraction, say less than 10% of the changes made in the EV. And what is more, not one of those changes which are regarded as serious and against which such a storm of protest has raised, and that from men of the highest scholarship and deepest piety, would have been made. In that case, it is likely also that the changes would have commended themselves to the majority of discriminating Bible users. Therefore, we should take careful note of the principles that were adopted and of the materials that were used in the compilation of the later Greek texts of the New Testament. Of the most important of these, we shall proceed now to speak briefly. Gaius Boer's edition, 1805. This text appeared about 150 years after the Elzeva edition. In the meantime, an enormous amount of new materials had been gathered and was available for whatever help it might afford in the effort to arrive at a true original reading. But the added mass of evidence was the task of examination. The more laborious, and moreover, it raised again and again the difficult question of the relative credibility of conflicting witnesses. Graysback, in the compilation of his text, proceeded upon a plan and principles of his own, which need not be here described. In cases of doubt and difficulty, he seemed to follow the Texas Receptus. Hence, his departures were not serious, and in any case, his text is not regarded today as having any special authority. Lackman, 1842 to 1850. This editor appears to have been the first to act upon the theory or principle that the more ancient the manuscript, the more worthy of credence. The extent to which this idea has been allowed to control in the settling of disputed readings without regard to other weighty considerations whereby the credibility of the contradictory witnesses should properly have been determined is very extraordinary. This matter calls for special attention, not only because of the important part it played in the settling of the text for the revised version, but because it seemed to be quite generally given for granted that the older the manuscript, the more worthy to be believed where there is a conflicting testimony. We propose, therefore, to examine this rule and evidence with some care later on. And in that connection, we will endeavour to show why we believe that the principles which controlled in the compilation of the Texas Receptus is far more conformable to the sound rules of evidence and hence more likely to lead to right conclusions than that adopted by Lackman and his successors. Lackman seems to have conceived a prejudicial dislike for the Texas Receptus and, as a good authority expressed it, to have set to work to form a text independent of that, right or wrong. He stated that the theory of ancient evidence only, thus sweeping away many copies and much evidence because they dated below his fixed period. In fact, he did not seek to arrive at the original inspired writings but merely to recover the text as it was in the 4th century. This principle first adopted by Lackman and followers with well nigh calamitous results for his successors including Drs Westcott and Hort who were responsible for the text which underlies the RV is based upon the tactic assumption that there existed in the 4th century a Greek text 
which was generally accepted and which was also virtually pure. But it is now recognised that the very worst corruptions of the various writings are those which occurred prior thereto. And not only so, and not only so, but at the time of the appearance of the RV, Doctors Westcott and Hort put forth an elaborate explanation of the principles adopted by them in the making of their Greek text, which up to that time had been privately circulating among the revisionists and under injunctions of strict secrecy. And in it, they admitted that the Texas Receptus is substantially identical with the text used in the churches of Syria and elsewhere in and prior to the 4th century. To this important feature of the case, we will refer more in detail later on, for it proves that the authors of the text adopted by the revisers, while appealing to the principle of ancient evidence as the reason for their departures from the received text, have made admissions which show that they in fact acted directly contrary to that principle. Now, as to the assumption that because a given text or manuscript dated from the 4th century, it will be purer than one of a later date, we quote the following statement of one who was generally regarded as the ableist textual critic of those days, Dr. Frederick H. A. Scrivener, who, in his introduction to the text of the New Testament, 3rd edition, page 511, says, It is no less true to fact that paradoxical in sound that the worst corruptions to which the New Testament has ever been subjected originate within a hundred years after its composition, that Irenaeus and the African Fathers and the whole Western Church with a portion of the Syrian had far inferior manuscripts to those employed by Stunnaker and Erasmus or Stevens 13 centuries later when moulding the Texas Receptus, but Lackman proceeded in disregard of this fact, and no doubt because ignorant of it, he thus set a bad example, and unfortunately his example has been followed by editors who came after him, men of great learning, unquestionability, and having accurate knowledge of early Greek, but apparently knowing little of the history of the various Greek manuscripts, and nothing at all of the laws of evidence and how to deal with problems involving the investigation of a mass of conflicting testimony. Tistendorf, 1865 to 1872. This scholar, whose great abilities and unremitting labours are widely recognised, has had a dominating influence in the formation of the modern text. Tistendorf produced upon a plan proceeded upon a plan which we give in his own words. The text is to be sought only from ancient evidence, and especially from Greek manuscripts, but without neglecting the testimonies of versions and fathers. From this we see that Tissendorf thoroughly committed himself to the principle of giving the ancient evidence the deciding voice in all disputed readings that he should have adopted this principle was specially unfortunate because of the circumstances that Tistendorf himself was the discoverer of the famous Codex Sinaiticus, of which we shall have occasion to speak more particularly later. Which manuscripts is reputed the most ancient, but one of all the now existing Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, and which, therefore, upon the principle referred to, is entitled to the, the highest degree of credibility. But whether or not the Sinaitic manuscript is the most ancient of all, now known to exist, it is beyond any doubt whatever, whatever the most defective, corrupt and untrustworthy. Our reasons for this assertion, reasons which are ample to establish it, will be given later on. We wish at this point merely to note the fact, leaving the proof thereof for a subsequent chapter, that the most serious of the many departures of the EV from the AV are due to the unhappy conjunction 
of an unsound principle of evidence and the fortuitous discovery by a scholar who had accepted that principle of a very ancient Greek manuscript of the New Testament, a manuscript which despite its unquestionable antiquity turns out to be the worst and most scandalously corrupt of all the Greek texts now known to exist. Tregellus. This editor was contemporary with Tissendorf. As stated in his own words, his purpose was to give the text on the authority of the oldest manuscript and versions, and with the aid of the earlier citations, so as to present as far as possible the text commonly received in the 4th century. This, it will be observed, is substantially the plan proposed by Lackman, and these are the precedents which seem to have mainly influenced Westcott and Hort in the compilation of their text, which is virtually the text from which the EV was made. Dr. Scrivener says, introduction page 342, Lackman's text seldom rests on more than four Greek codices, very often on three, not infrequently on two, sometimes on only one. His fallacy, which was adopted by Tregellus, necessarily proved fatal to the text prepared by the latter, who in fact acted upon the astounding assumption that 89 90ths of the existing manuscripts and other authorities might be safely rejected, in order that he might be free to follow a few early documents of bad repute. This tendency in a wrong direction found a still further development in Tissendorf and came to full fruition in Westcott and Hort, who were allowed to fashion, according to their own ideas, the Greek text of the RV. Alford. The work of this editor, who is rated high as a Greek scholar, though we know not how competent he was to decide questions of fact where there was conflict of testimony, was subsequent to that of the two preceding editors. Concerning their work he says that, if Tissendorf had run into a fault on the side of speculative hypotheses concerning the origins of writings found in these manuscripts, it must be confessed that Tregellus has sometimes erred on the certainly far safer side of scrupulous adherence to the more literal evidence of the ancient manuscripts. Olford's text was constructed to state in his own words by following in all ordinary cases the united or prepondering testimony of the most ancient authorities. Later evidence was taken into consideration by him only when the most ancient authorities did not agree or preponderate. It seems not to have occurred to this learned man any more than to the others that mere antiquity was not a safe test of reliability where witnesses are in conflict and that a late copy of a correct original should be preferred to a corrupt manuscript of earlier date.